Okay, everybody. Uh, welcome to the community meeting on November 15th. I literally had to recheck because I forgot what day today is. Um, as always, feel free to submit any issues or topics that you would like to discuss in the issue tracker, submitting that one also here on the chat channel. And without further ado, I would like to start with the first big topic, and that is cluster workspace redesign. Stefan. Yeah, if you click on the first, or the second link maybe first, like MD. Okay. Okay, that's my public one. <laughs> wait, wait a second. <laughs> maybe I can open it. Doesn't matter if it doesn't work, just go back and show the overview. I think when you're logged in, you can, everybody can read it. Change so it's a design it about, about cluster workspaces. So I keep talking while you try. Um, so cluster workspaces, they live in parent clusters. And when going to sharding, like implementing sharding, you realize quickly that looking into the parent is a bad idea. Because the parent and the sub space can live in different shards or different regions, even or something like that. So depending on the parent is always bad, the scenario. And um, for other resources like API exports and schemas, we figured we will just distribute them in a cache. So uh, have a distributed cache where every shard can basically eventually consistently access and see everything. But for workspaces, um, that's not a good idea because there might be many. So um, we thought about what to do, and we, we decided, well, there's no need to look into the parent if everything we need to, to answer a request is in the workspace itself. And this design here, uh, we worked on that we, we, um, like for the last two months or three months, and we had at least two meetings, I remember, where we talked about it. Um, it suggests a new data model, uh, more or less, about workspaces. From a user point of view, it's mostly the same, but um, internally it looks different. And um, yeah, I think you can now go to the other, to the first link. So if you want to read details about what changes and uh, about the order, how we implement it, that's there in this document. But for now, um, this one I think is better. This shows the, the data model change. Um, yeah, stay there. Um, the orange boxes are the ones the user sees. So today there is a workspace uh, at the bottom left, and behind it there is a cluster workspace. And workspaces is the user-facing one, cluster workspace is the internal one, but workspace is just a projection of cluster workspaces today. So when you create a workspace, actually you, you create a cluster workspace in, in, in NCD. Um, to know that a cluster on the right, so I have of, of two logical clusters here on the right side, and um, they have some green boxes here uh, in the picture. Imagine those green boxes are not there, like in main branch today. Those green boxes don't exist, okay? To know that this workspace exists on chart B, you have to look on the left, on the orange, okay? So we cannot authorize today without looking on the parent. So the first idea was, um, let's put something into the actual cluster, like create a, um, an object like the green one here and um, use that for authorization. Forget about the orange for authorization. That's what, what we have done. So we can, um, we know that, ex well, we know the existence of a workspace without looking on the parent. The second step is you see at the bottom, those light green um, boxes there. We also moved um, the airbag objects, like the cluster role bindings into the workspace itself. So in the past, we had them next to those orange boxes there, and you could give admin or access uh, to, to a workspace. We moved them inside. This has two nice properties. I mean, they're inside, okay, so we can authorize again, completely independent of the parent cluster. Um, the other advantage is, um, and you see it here in the example, the cluster role binding for the admin is not a special thing anymore um, as it was before. You remember this workspace content um, resource, which was artificial. This goes away. This is a normal cluster role binding, which just binds a user to cluster admin as a whole. Um, for access, we had to do a little bit um, different thing. So we, we use um, the non-resource 
slash access. Like when you can access that, you have access to the cluster. But as before, access is just the bare minimum to enter. It doesn't give you any read access to anything. So this is a big change. Big, not for the user. The user will still see workspaces. Um, but at least for controller authors, they should focus on this workspace. So forget about cluster workspaces. In, a, in a another step of this change, we will get rid of cluster workspaces completely, which means there's a small arrow on the left uh, between workspace and cluster workspace. We will turn around the, the order, like the cluster workspace will become a projection of the workspace, at least temporarily. And eventually, we even remove that. And then the workspace is the only object in the parent uh, you, you can see. But if you if you build controllers, especially those which work on, on virtual workspaces, or even if you build a virtual workspace API server, use this workspace. Don't depend on workspace or cluster workspace. Um, that's change. Yeah, some, some changes at the top if you look on this front proxy. So the front proxy is basically the same as before, but um, it has to know both kinds. It knows about this workspace and about workspace. So it has to reconstruct hierarchy in memory by looking on those objects from all charts. And basically, it can map again um, the old root column something um, workspaces, workspace paths to uh, the actual workspaces. So yes. Just a small question that, that refers actually to the access thing. I'm not sure if I um, understood it correctly. Today, the semantic is that if you want to give users access to child workspaces, you simply bind them on the parent workspace with the access pattern, right? So yeah. you have sort of like one, one point of entry to submitting RBAC and gate the entry for users. Now you have to do it per workspace. So you need to have. Mm, yeah, yeah. Right? That's true. Um, if this is a use case, one can think about other ways to do that. Like we can. So what we do today in this intermediate step, we are syncing um, the Airbug uh, objects from the parent into the workspaces. And then they are there and they are local. We can talk about those things as well. If it's, it's a strong use case, a big use case, yeah, there are solutions for that. Got it. Just to finish up um, before we go into questions, Andy, one second. Just yeah, you can finish, finish one thing. Um, you see here the dev, uh, the KCP dev cluster annotation in, in every object. We have it today, right? But today we write a root colon something as a whole path into that um, field. We will change that and turn it into um, an ID. So basically, the, the hierarchy will not be visible by that anymore. The hierarchy is still there because there are those workspace objects, the orange objects. So you can reconstruct the hierarchy. But the objects in a, in, a, in a logical cluster, they have the string, and the string will be just an ID. So maybe an 8-character or 12-character something base 36 string. Um, this allows us later on to move workspaces in the hierarchy, for example, and this always stays the same. It's, it's an idea, it's like a unit, you need an identifier for this workspace. This will also come. And another thing, maybe the last thing you see, when you look on the right workspace, the user colon Lukash one, that one is a parentless workspace. So there's no, there's no orange object, right? There's nothing which points to that workspace which means this is parentless and um, it's another root. So the root workspace as we know it today is a workspace which has a cluster ID root. That's a special one. Any other workspace can also be a root. So this, I'm not sure I can read it, L, J, H, G, and so on. So this eight character string on the right. This can be used as another root if you want to. This will allow us to decouple user home workspaces from the hierarchy. So this logic around um, buckets, uh, you remember it. It's very complicated in code. We had a couple of bugs, uh, races basically creating this uh, hierarchy. This will completely go away. User home workspaces will be super simple after that. 
Um, the logic to call this thing user colon Lukash is actually in the front proxy. So it's just an alias the front proxy applies. When you talk to user colon Lukash, it will use some hash. So in the example, I just took a, a shard 224 and space 36 of that, and I get a string, and this is basically the name of the cluster. So that way we can add new roots if you want to. Um, in the hierarchy case, an organization could be another root, which will decouple organizations from the root workspace, which is also a good thing to do because then the root workspace is not crowded and not uh, yeah, a single point of failure anymore. Um, I think that's it. So uh, just about state, uh, Andy, I haven't uh, forgotten you. Um, we have a PR which creates those green objects, but they are not active yet. Like when we merge that, they exist, they are synced all the time, but they are not used for authorization, for example, yet. There will be a second PR which then switches uh, around, basically inverses all the controllers to look on this workspace for everything and ignore the orange ones. I mean, there where it makes sense. And also turn around workspace in cluster workspace, the projection. And eventually there will be a third one which removes cluster workspace. All right, so any. I just wanted to say we are soliciting ideas for better names than this workspace for the, uh, the green box. So uh, we could call it logical cluster. There was a suggestion earlier to call it dot workspace, but something I think, I think we'll want something other than this workspace because it is confusing <laughs> when you are talking about an instance of a this workspace versus this meaning the current workspace. Yeah, it, just important, um, this is user facing. So logic cluster, I don't think is a good one. Yeah, I yeah, I think, it I think workspace, we, local, whatever. I think if we call it logical cluster, we will confuse ourselves when we're talking about the logical construct in etcd yeah. in the storage versus a actual cr called of type logical cluster so Which, yeah we need some other some other name uh so should be something put your, put your with, idea works, on. with workspace i think logical cluster is really the technical term i'm not sure it's good. workspace definition or something like that steve you have a raised hand Yeah, I was wondering if we, since we're not encoding um, the hierarchy in the name anymore, does that change uh, the approach needed for caching workspace types? Um, yeah, so we we have a variant of the design, and we, maybe this is a good topic, like the types, where we have a hierarchy in a different annotation. If we need that, we can always re-edit this way. I think what you're talking about basically is we cannot walk up um, the hierarchy, right, um, implicitly. You always need something, like you need something well-founded, like the root of your hierarchy. Um, this works well in kubectl. Kubectl can just keep um, yeah, the whole string. And also here on the left side, if you look on the URL of the orange, there is a full string. So if you have that, you can walk around freely. But of course, if we just point to a this workspace, this is lost. So we have to talk about that. Great. Are there any more questions or suggestions for better naming? Please submit them. <laughs> Okay, cool. Pretty exciting. That's going to be a big change. Uh, Stefan, one, line qu one last question from my side. Um, I mean, we're not in super productive mode yet, but um, I guess we're going to have a migration strategy from the current way how we store things in etcd, right? <laughs> yes, yes and no. Um, we have this first PR which puts everything in place. Of course, there are changes in how works, uh, how controllers work eventually, and also um, the home workspaces. So there's code in our second PR, which um, 
looks for the existence of the old home first. So this is not, not deleted or invisible suddenly, but of course it's still in this bucket hierarchy. So I think eventually there will be an etcd vibe and we start fresh. Gotcha. All right. Um, is there anything more? You have a couple of more references in here. Anything that is worth talking about? Phase A implementation yeah, just, or? Okay. Just the two PRs. All right. Yeah. Okay. All right. Great. Thanks a lot. Um, any comments regarding cluster workspace? Once, twice. All right. Then next topic KCP in the box with Han Chart. Yeah, if you could leave me last, I still multitasking a bit. All right, okay. <laughs> In that case, we are skipping over to um, proposed new KCP IO investigation for Edge multi cluster. Yes, I can go here. So uh, we've been working along the lines of building out the new Edge MC <clears throat> um, sub org inside KCP Dev. And one of the areas we thought might be useful for us to have traffic directed towards the edge multi-cluster use case is to have its own specific investigation inside the kcp.io website. And so to do so, we've come up with a preliminary uh, doc that would be represented. That's in a PR there, number 18. <clears throat> and if you look at the files change there, so the one it basically took the structure of the the transparent multi cluster. Uh, we went ahead and redid some of the paragraphs at the top, and then at the bottom, there's still some that are commented out that we still haven't gotten, uh, you know, entirely fleshed out. But we're working on it. So I wanted to know if just in general, if this is a useful thing, if people thought that this is something that might be supported. Uh, or something that they might like to have inside the kcp.io website. So to understand, um, you're talking about the investigation docs or paste to link those which are living here today. So they, they show up when you go to documentation to reference or something, you have an investigation folder or something on the left side. Correct. So the way we envisioned it would potentially look would be, I'm just grabbing it here in one second. There we go, boom. And I'll share. I think it's uh, Stefan. Just a general question: um, What is the scope of this investigation? Kind of uh, sub deal in the KCPIO. What should be inside it? And you also mentioned that there is a work to kind of break right uh, the monolithic KCP into different repositories. So. In the future, I assume that still investigation on each of those areas, right? Uh, TMC, tenancy, and so on will end up in this kind of page, right? You are not going to open it. Yeah, I think we haven't talked about how to organize the documentation. But okay. yes, if we split up the repository, probably we won't also split up the documentation, but have them somehow available in one place later on. But we haven't talked about that. Any yeah, so I think, that? I think this point that Andy uh, present is we want to just get the not the content right. There is, there will be a PR to to review the actual content. Just the general question: Do you think it's suitable to put an edge kind of uh, investigation item under KCPIO or not? It's fine if it's not. Just let us know. Andy, go ahead. I think it is. I think that the KCPIO website is applicable to the broader umbrella of what we want to achieve with KCP overall. And um, 
the, the website is obviously fairly young in terms of age and structure. So we will evolve it over time. I think as the repository split and we have a KCP core and a TMC and so on and so forth, the website will gain some restructuring as well. But at this point, any visibility is better than no visibility. So I'd say, let's just find a spot. Like we can, we can put it in that investigation spot and, and call it a day for now. And uh, you know, we can post about it on social and try and get more people interested. And then over time, we'll restructure as needed. Uh, just a comment from my side, because I've been thinking about this right now as well. I think restructuring later, having everything in one spot is even easier than gathering all the topics probably scattered around different repositories. So also a good argument for have this on the KCPIO side. All right, sounds good. Sims, we converged against the uh, consensus. Any more com comments about this topic? So I assume this is sort of like agreed. <laughs> I, uh, I learned something very early on in my career is always stop talking when somebody says yes. <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> okay, good. All right. In that case, I'll stop, talk I'll stop talking about this topic as well. Um, <laughs> if anybody else has comments or suggestions regarding the uh, additional topics on the KCPIO side. And now, are we ready for KCP in the box with time chart? Yeah, okay, let me share my screen. Start out the sharing. So while I do that, so I've been playing with KCP on, on this peer time. And one of the challenges I found when I started initial playing on the side project, I chose a path of vendoring in KCP, but I soon found it that it's it will not scale basically for the service development and that. And the next one was to how to run it basically fast if I need to do a page or some to somebody or even for simple development. So I started working on the Helm chart revamping and I saw Kyle just left when I needed his input. But basically the chart itself uh, is being updated to work on the public GitHub images. And I was thinking on adding this a bit of uh, a script. It's a simple shell script, which what it does, it's, it's installs basically everything what you need to run KCP in the kind with a supporting infrastructure and gives you easy development environment, even for showcases or for service development. Example. So I'm rerunning that now, but what it will do, it will spit out a few, few configs for you. One is for the root cluster, which runs cert manager, dex, ingress, pointing to local, uh, local environment, etcd. And what I have in addition is I have a reverse dialer. So basically, when you want to do a development locally, you want the environment to behave the same in the Two cluster like in, in your local development. So instead of like pushing images and things like that, I just have everything in the same ingress point, which goes through the reverse dial to my local machine. So you can run process locally like a service developer or you're writing an operator and you don't need to deploy anything. You just like go run and it interacts with a KCP inside. So, and if you, you do like KCP, you config. It basically goes through the ingress with the certificates and just interacts with the KCP itself, which is, I think it's quite nice. It's like not a rocket science, but quite nice add on to the development itself, how easily you can spin up a KCP and, and work towards, towards what you want. I don't know. So I was thinking basically in addition to Helm charts, add this shell machinery to the Helm charts repo with a small readme, like how to get started soon, potentially with a 
pointing to the controller's runtime example as a as an example to run via like reverse dialer, basically how you would do that outside. And just basically wanted to open for discussion what people think about this. Uh, just a small question from my side, because you know, like being somebody who works on KCP and simply starts the local binary, what would you say um, brings brings the Helm chart um, through the table? Is it like a sharded setup, or like what it's, is the benefit of having ingress? So one thing is that it's like don't get me wrong, like running locally, it's 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 always better when you're working on KCP core itself. But if you want to test example, like full integration with identity provider, with front proxy, with uh, virtual stuff, like everything in one box. It's like, I found few issues with um, like reverse DNS resolutions and things like that. And as a, when it's more beneficial for somebody who works to use KCP in their stack and not develop KCP itself. Gotcha. So it's useful for somebody who needs to have things like the front proxy and potentially, I think the additional future benefit could be also sharding and especially uh, testing yeah. that setup as well, um, where I could see the benefit of here. It's, it's just basically bootstrapping people fast to run it. There was a few questions in a chat, like how do I run it in a container? How do I run it in my Q cluster just to give a proof of concept where go run is more tech savvy. It's easy when you basically are into that, but when you're just coming in, it might be an easier entry point into the testing what you're working on. Yeah. Stefan, go ahead. So I'm not against different uh, yeah, methods to, to deliver our artifacts, basically. But my question is always, how is this tested and maintained like when we change something like we, we change a flag in kcp how will we make sure this doesn't break or is it uh, is it hard coded to a version or something like that currently it's pointing to the latest but yeah i think in the long run the helm chart should be pointing to the release version and once you do a release you basically have to go and update it to to do that I suspect if if the bearish, if Helm chart becomes usable as a delivery method of that, some maintenance will be required there. Like I, I don't think it will be like that much of the maintenance at this point. But yeah, like some intern tests will need to add in the Helm chart, basically spin a plus there, see if it's response and like, can you get workspaces on basic coverage? But that should be straightforward. Um, small question from my side. I think KCP um, can be set up and configured in, in various ways, right? Um, have you experimented with, so I think Helm is great as, as a first start. However, like from, from personal experience, Helm is, like can become quite limited whenever you need to extend beyond the you know canonical setup <laughs> with some basic templating. Have you experimented maybe with things like Q or JSON to provide a more sort of like a approach that lets you assemble an infrastructure around KCP um, a little bit more dynamic with like a concrete example? Yeah, Please no JSON. No. <laughs> okay. Yeah, no. honestly, no. I at this point basically Helm covered my use cases and I didn't want to over-engineer that because that wasn't my goal. Like the goal was just to get myself running fast so I can develop using KCP as a as a framework. And like when the changes are being released in the main KCP repository, I didn't want to re-vendor each and every day basically. And pointing to latest image helps to do that quite fast. Right. Um, I think this looks cool. I think we still have like some thought, food of thought process going on around maintainability, I guess. Stefan, coming back to your point, right? Um, 
and also to flexibility with um, yeah looks looks cool at yeah, first sight i would like to see another bullet point there under to do what is the maintenance strategy this can be one or two names to to the release every month basically can be end-to-end -end test like something technical but anything in this direction is necessary cool yeah okay i was thinking adding simple end-to-end -end test basically to see if it's running but i suspect it will require like code maintenance once we once the sharding is fixed once the virtual workspaces can run outside like they will be needed with some yaml changes and the other raised hand yeah so assuming we do want to keep the helm charts repository and i don't see any reason to delete it we do need ci for it and the problem we're facing right now is we don't have an easy way to run containers in our ci environment uh the way that you can just like use Docker and spin up something. So I know Steve had been looking into some ideas for how to do that, but until we figure that out, I don't think that we're easily going to have a, a CI approach that we can use, at least what, with our um, infrastructure. What's the status with GitHub runners on that KCP dev repository? Like I found them quite, easy to cover these kind of cases in other projects but it depends basically on the project quota and can we use them yeah i think if you'd like the test to take about an hour and a half to finish and be fairly flaky they're they're really useful but i think we've run into a bunch of issues with that yeah I so think the, ideally we can the, find prow like an, an approach with prow but it's not super straightforward the other broader thing was um, like if, even if we did manage to do a like fully containerized sharded test using kind or something similar, I think the point at which you have like five shards running with five at CDs and test clients, um, I was concerned about the size of that altogether. Uh, it's hard to schedule something that needs like 10 vCPUs. I think at the point we're running multiple shards in this one, it's outside Helm charts repository scope altogether. This should be just basically, this is how you run it. And charts should be both to deploy that stuff potentially individual shards or things like that but i don't think it's a right place for some this kind of scale test uh i don't think scale is what i'm after i think once you have more than one shard like there are critical correctness guarantees that must be true about the system and the way caching works and the way communication happens um, so I, I agree that I think Helm may not be a good solution for managing five shards. I think Helm might be a good solution for managing, you know, all the things that are co-located with one shard. Um, but in general, yeah, I think more thought needs to be put into how we would test um, with five. Yeah, I agree. Don't have a good answer to that, but yeah, for sure. All right, so TLDR from my side um, generally looks good. Uh, two um, like major open topics are CI readiness and um, the question around maintainership. So I guess once we clarify those two points, maybe we can um, have a better traction on, on these charts. Yeah, let's take this offline. I will get this PR to the shape it can be looked at because a lot of, I still have a lot of changes in the different branch. And I just turn up a chat. Chat. All right. Okay. Does anybody else have opinions or comments around Helm charts? Twice, once. Okay. Let's see what else we have left. 
Um, I think that's all the topics for today, unless somebody wants to chime in short term. Ezra? Yeah, I have one quick uh, kind of question slash uh, request. I find it very hard to, fa to, you know, there is a huge amount of design documents circulating around people putting on private uh, Google uh, kind of drive, putting it on HackMD now and so on. So if you're in a middle of discussion, it's very easy. But for a newcomer that just want to see, you know, a list repository of all, it's impossible. It's very hard. You end up on links on documents that say, oh, it's not up, up to date. It is replaced with another document and so on. So it's very hard. So if there is a way that we can put all the, you know, even not everything, all the important stuff, you know, voluntarily, you know, people will move to, to that place. It will be very, very helpful. I have like hundreds of uh, kind of uh, pointers in, in my browser just to maintain the, those documents. Yep, I'm pretty sure I know what Stefan and Andy are going to say. Maybe, Stefan, you go first. <laughs> yeah, a shout out to a pull request from Paul. Um, what's, I think it's a pull request um, with process changes, like what is 2023 for KCP? And one part is uh, about uh, enhancements. I think, uh, I mean, the comment is side, of course. We have a mixture of documents, a mixture of uh, platforms we use to, to talk about those things. Uh, if you want to open that, exactly. So um, we should have an enhancement repository. And at a certain maturity level of an enhancement, there should be a pull request here for discussion. I think this will make it easier. It won't make google docs go away i guess um just just one hint um if you join the the google group of kcp i'm not sure everybody has done that the public one the, so we at least use use that to, um, to give permission because when we open a document within red hat um we cannot open it to the world so we use that google group um to give access so maybe just check that this is the case and yeah my you can see them no, I don't mind it's in Google Docs. I just want a shared directory for everyone instead of using your... There is a way to do that. Uh, we can open one and then everyone can just create documents there. Yeah. That's maybe an idea. So maybe inside of this group, does this work? Yeah, yeah, can, excellent. You can try, yeah. And actually there is a link to that in the readme, but it's empty. So no one is actually using it, so... All right, um, Andy, you also have a raised hand. Please go ahead. Yeah, so at last week's meeting, we talked about lazy consensus on those pull requests, assuming there were no um, serious outstanding issues. I don't believe there are. So uh, if there's any, uh, any unresolved comments, let's make sure we get them resolved and I'll go through and um, see if this thing's ready for merging. And uh, I can create an enhancements repo I can start trying to move any docs I've created into the shared drive and uh, over time as time permits, and I think we should include it in planning, we should uh, diligently go back and create retroactive enhancements documents for the major features that we already have, as well as creating new ones. And I believe that's spelled out in this doc as well. <laughs> All right. Um, in that case, if there are no more comments, I would say we continue on the triaging of incoming issues unless there are more comments regarding proposals for the Google Drive enhancement proposals, design discussions. Going once, twice. And let's switch over to the incoming issues. Um, bug, the front proxy doesn't expose metrics. I recall APR 
Chris, maybe you can say a word or two regarding this one. Just loop it to in progress. Right. Okay. KCP panics when trying to lead bound CRD and the corresponding API binding exists. Kyle. So I can't remember. We mitigated this. I, I, this came up because I was working on deleting CRDs that get left over when all the API bindings and exports are gone. Um, and we mitigated that particular problem, but I don't think conceivably you could still hit a panic um, in other ways because there's still the code where the panic is still in the in the cube fork. But I don't know if that's something that we actually would be considered in scope for KCP. Yep, Stefan. Um, has there been any investigation whether panic kills the process? Because if this is the case, we must fix that. That's a very important issue. So when I was experiencing the panic, it killed the process. If and this is the case, yeah, please open an issue, market time bomb. And it, it, but I, it's, I don't think now that we, we set the annotation, which I know we didn't go into no, that. No, even, even independent of the fix, this must not happen. We cannot make the process panic. I mean, panic, yes, but exit on panic. Because if this is the case, the next bug can be exploited from outside. That's very dangerous. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Yeah, this yeah. ends up being a uh, how to DOS KCP, yes. <laughs> step one. So we have this so Kyle, um, runtime handle error, which should catch those things. If it doesn't, somebody has to investigate why not. Yeah, so Kyle, if you can file an issue that KCP should not panic or should not exit when it receives a panic, um, one of us will take a look at it. And then if you can see if you can still reproduce this, and if the answer is yes, then I think uh, we need to fix the bug. Yeah, makes sense. So Sergius, let's move this to either backlog or next, depending on what Kyle's availability or anybody's availability is. I don't think it's a super high priority because it we we mitigated the main issue. So I would probably do backlog. I agreed, yeah. We stopped the bleeding. Um, from what I saw. Yes. Okay, put it to backlog. Okay. The panic yes, itself. Chris? Yeah, I was just gonna comment. The panic itself was actually from twenty sixteen. So it's been there for a while with the to do to propagate the error up. So I don't think it's exclusive to KCP, it's just something that exists. So I mean you can see it fixed upstream. It's actually in the etcd handling code um, down in the uh, package registry API service etcd. Fun. Okay. All right. Um, on to the next bug. Initializing workspaces. Virtual workspace allows okay. access to any workspace regardless of status. Andy? I have a PR for this, so it's in progress. Gotcha. Needs review. Is it okay to put it in your review then? I guess so. Sure. I don't, I haven't really been distinguishing between new and most of the other statuses, but yeah. Okay, cool. Uh, so much around bugs and the rest is features. Um, create an in-cluster authorizer to avoid checking with parent workspaces. I recall, Stefan, is this something what yeah, it's all about to work at? That's one step of phase B of this proposal. Yes, I recall. Okay, cool. So that seems to be even in progress, no? Yeah, um, we have to meet for a pair programming session, but yes, in general. Okay. Next, maybe you're in progress. Don't, don't gotcha. 
regarding milestone, oh, no, this is not here, but what's the semantic? Should I put it rather in next, Andy? Rather than in progress? I think that makes sense. Okay. Okay, next design proposal, decide on an approach for handling KCP specific metrics. We're exposing KCP specific metrics for the auth crash and front proxy and they're using the registry, re legacy registry for them. Should we move away from it? If so, what's the strategy? Um, I yeah, asked Chris to file this because there's, I I'm not intimately familiar with the metrics packages upstream, but there is a legacy registry and there is a non-legacy registry. As far as I can tell, only the legacy registry seems to be used, but yes, uh, you know, I'd say this is like low priority or backlog priority. It so, is. I can shed a little light on this one though, because um, I've been heavily involved in the observability subsystems, both upstream and in OpenShift. The legacy legacy registry is called legacy registry because it is uh, initialized as a package initializer, which is generally discouraged. In general, all the Go programs out there. The, there is a cap upstream to move away from this idiom um, and not to initialize the Prometheus registry as a you know a static variable inside a package. So this, has, this has like funky side effects if you import things as a library. Things might get initialized twice, depending on how they import things, and rather use you know classic dependency injection into constructors. Uh, for a Prometheus registry, and that cap also outlines how to do that whenever introducing new metrics. Um, if there is interest, I can um, put pointers to the cap how to do that, how to accomplish that. It's, you know, the idiom is don't initialize the Prometheus registry as a static variable, just dependency injected in the controllers wherever you need to expose metrics. Um, essentially, how you should do things. So maybe that clears things up. But it's, yeah, it's kind of low priority, but it, uh, you know, as a good citizen, probably a, a good first issue or a low hanging fruit, so to say. Um, so, backlog or backlog? backlog. Me, right? Yeah. Yeah, backlog is just we want to do something about it at some point, but yeah, yeah not right now. <laughs> and the last one feature DNS isolation level should be configurable. Uh, maybe the first ah here we go yeah uh well so in any multi-tenant system uh you need to draw the you need to decide where you draw the line for the boundaries of isolation right, right? um and we draw some line in the current uh, implementation and uh, we can draw different lines so this is this issue to capture uh what we want to do in the future about uh dns I mean, isolation is specifically about DNS in here. Um, I don't think that's critical. That's not very important. So it could go to the backlog, most likely, if you think it's something interesting. That's related to the discussion of isolating um, the synchro on the target clusters um, from yeah, other workloads, right? So I, I guess there was a big, big discussion around network policies, and this is around like one method that adds it, namely using VNS name service, right? Yes, um, Stefan, yeah. if you want to. Speak so first. this would be a flag on the synchro, I guess. I, I don't think maybe I don't know how to do this. Uh, how to exp um, expose this it could be when you create a new workspace maybe you decide that the isolation is going to be less strong than than for other workspaces i mean i, I don't know what the user experience is going to be right uh, but it's the idea of offering some configuration options um in the you know around isolations for uh, I mean people, right? Yeah, I think I think we should probably go through. I mean, based. I mean, this issue is 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 great because you know it's a way to track uh, the question, and then probably we should have some design sessions 
um, really related to that, especially, especially you know, to know how it, you know, because there, there are two things here, it seems to me. Uh, one thing is the DNS consistency inside a, a, a workspace and the namespaces of a workspace, which is um, what has been worked on currently. So first we, we want, we might want to configure that, uh, you know, to allow some namespace some namespaces from different workspaces to be able to discuss together. That's one point. And the other point is about possibly configuring the level of hard isolation between uh, namespaces on physical clusters coming originating from various workspaces. And on this second point, uh, I think we, we probably need to have some sort of you know design discussions and also you know know if it's really what we want because the approach also midterm long term would be possibly to really have a hard limitation in in entering really a very hard tenancy on the physical clusters uh, related you know that reflects the tenancy on the workspaces so maybe you know so maybe it would it could be opt in or opt out opt out from this tenancy globally i don't know but we have to define what we want here you know before thinking of the implementation i think does it make sense yes all right so please help me backlog or nest uh not next as far as i can tell <laughs> <laughs> unless anyone thinks differently but backlog surely backlog yeah in mind. all right okay put it on backlog um tip, tip, tip. list this entry uh i think there is another topic around milestone epics um there is one point basic api priority and fairness for kcp I don't know what to do with that one. It's an open. You can, you can skip this section. Oh, um, all right. I can give a quick update. So Jamie has done a lot of work to get it started. Um, I am helping to hopefully get the last bits in place. Um, it's going to take a while to get our two approaches merged together. Uh, he he did a lot of excellent work getting um, kind of half the puzzle in place that I'm <laughs> working on the other half. Um, so it's still going to take some time, but we're actively working on it. All right. Any comments regarding issues? Something that we missed during trash? In that case. Everybody gains five minutes back of their lives, unless you have anything to say. Going once, going twice. Thanks a lot for this community meeting. See you next week. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.